Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real Me In Colon A Movie Podcast where you didn't really ask for it but hey I'm gonna give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where I talk about anything, everything, and well anything about movies. I'm your host Chase Lee and I'm by myself today like usual and uh, I got a lot of notes to cover. I got, uh, there's really not really trailers that kind of came out this week. Um, and then the uh, bulk of the podcast will, which will, which is the title I will go over the three films that I've seen at Dallas International Film Festival uh, so far, and uh, that's why it's part one, because next week will be a full-on uh, part two where I'll just have nothing but those movies. And then I'm going to talk about um, Daredevil, the television series that Netflix has made. Uh, I watched the first two episodes, and uh, you know I got, I got some thoughts on it. And then, of course, box office results for the weekend, and you guys will have no fucking idea how much... Fury 7 has made in two weeks. It's going to blow It's gonna blow your mind, okay? It's just going to blow it, and your brains are going to go all over the place, and your parents are going to wonder why your brain matter is all over the floor, and you're going to be like, well, Fury 7 made this much. Okay, so um, let's get this started, guys. Let's not waste any time because we don't want to do that. You guys already hate me well enough. I mean, we don't want to waste any time. So uh, some of the news stories that dropped this week, like I said, guys, this was a very slow week. And it was also a slow week for new releases. And if you guys fucking thought I was going to see The Longest Ride, that's really funny. That's cute. That's a good joke. Okay? Keep it up. Keep your stand-up going on the weekends because obviously you're really good at that. No, I, I'm not going to see another Nicholas Sparks adaptation. I'm sorry. The Notebook is the only bearable one I've ever like truly enjoyed. Everything else is just garbage. And I'm not. I'm not watching the longest ride. I'm not going to review it for you guys. You guys know it's garbage. If you know what a Nicholas Sparks movie is and you want to see it, then see it. If you do not like Nicholas Sparks movies, you don't need me to tell you that and shit on it for an hour. So, I. I just there was there's nothing this week. New releases, the news, the trailers, nada. So. Um, Let's start with the notes, uh, the the or the news. Uh, so, Entertainment Weekly is notorious for you know coming out with their like summer movie release, um, like kind of preview magazine where like you get to see everything coming out for like the next three months. There's like pictures, little snippets or whatever. There was a couple things that dropped just kind of out of the blue, and it's like okay, thanks for telling us. Um, the ver- like the. Most of, most of these uh, pieces of news are all Marvel related, just because that's all I kind of kind of saw this week. I mean, there was a DC thing. I can kind of briefly go over that, but it's not like a huge deal. Um, the first Marvel pick that was kind of released and kind of shown in full because we haven't really seen little to nothing about this character and the way he looks is that they released Vision, and Vision is uh, in Avengers: Age of Ultron. And from what I can gather, uh, I don't know how he's going to be created, but he's 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 not human. But I mean, he's built. He, he's a robot built like a superhero that's probably going to have humanistic traits. And he's played by Paul Bettany, who's been the voice of Jarvis, uh, you know, Iron Man's kind of like computer handyman for all of uh, the movies and stuff. So. It's kind of cool to see Paul Bettany actually play a role where you actually get to see him and not just hear his voice. But they released, like, the full Vision pick, and, like, I kind of dig it. It's got this really cool, like, uh, kind of dark purple, and, like, it's got this really kind of dark green on it. It just, it, because in the comics, he looks kind of cartoony and stuff, so I'm kind of glad they they brought him down to, like, a more uh, realistic approach, I guess, Um, or at least as realistic as possible. And so it looks really cool. I'm kind of excited to see uh, Paul Bettany play Vision and kind of bring that to life and stuff. And, you know, uh, speaking of Avengers 2, there were some press screenings that were held this weekend. Uh, For the most part, people like it a lot. Um, They say, like, the three words I keep hearing over and over again is, like, it's darker, it's weirder, and it's better than the first one. And then, But then I've heard some people say the first one's better, so... I have no clue, and uh, but just from looking at the picture, Vision looks really cool. So uh, I don't know much about the character, but now I'm excited to get to know him in the this universe. So uh, speaking of Age of Ultron, you know Joss Whedon he had an interview with Entertainment Weekly describing 
uh, Avengers 2 and whatnot. And so they asked him, you know, because this is a question that's on everyone's mind. Like, is there going to be a post credit scene? According to Joss, no, there's not. Um, and they said there's going to be one... Uh, like, because, you know, Marvel's, like, they're notorious for the whole post credit scenes. And so what they usually do is they have two of them. Uh, like, Avengers... Holy shit, you guys hear that? Fuck. Like, that's what I get for living near an airport. Um, okay, yeah, so the first uh, post credit scene is is kind of uh, after... <sighs> It's like in between. It's like there's a there's credits that play like just the basic um, you know crew members on a film and like the director, writer, producer, and then it cuts to the scene and then it goes into the credits again. And then Avengers, you know, did that and then they had the shawarma scene at the very end. So what Joss is saying is that there's not going to be a scene like shawarma. People are getting this confused as to like there's going to be no post scene credit scene with you ever. What? Guys, there's going to be a post credit scene. It's just going to be in the middle, like it usually has been, not at the very end as well. Um, so it doesn't bother me. I just, you know, I just really hope that the po- or the credit post credit scene that they do choose, uh, because they have to lead off into one or two things. They have to lead off into Ant Man, or they have to lead off into Civil War. I don't know which one they're going to go with, but. You know, Ant Man's gonna need some help. I mean, I'm excited to see Ant Man. I'm curious to see how they're gonna kind of pull this off or whatever. But at the same time, it's like I don't think anyone really knows it's coming out. So that movie's gonna need some help. Um, but I could also see them going the Civil War route and kind of setting that up. So I have no idea what the credit scene is gonna be. There's a lot of speculation on it, and I'm not gonna spend time talking about that because, uh, like I said, it's either gonna be Ant Man, Civil War. Or they're going to introduce a character. They they might introduce Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Spider Man. So it's it's going to be one of those three for sure. I just don't. I have no idea. I have to see the movie first, which I'm super excited about because now it's less than a month away. Boo fucking yeah! All right, so no pe- no post credit scene according to Joss. But then again, uh, Kevin Feige, the president of uh, Marvel Studios, is notorious for shooting stuff like two weeks before it comes out and then tagging it on at the end. That's how they did Shawarma. So, I don't know. Uh, The next uh, piece of news is that uh, there were some Fantastic Four photos that uh, were in the Entertainment Weekly magazine and stuff. Um, See, Entertainment Weekly is providing me with all my news this week. Uh, They had a clear look at The Thing, played by Jamie Bell. And um, The Thing... (laughs) The Thing is The Thing. um, In the old Fantastic Four movies with Michael Chiklis... Michael Chiklis is a big dude, and he could pull off that kind of brooding uh, type of character. Only problem is, when he played the thing, it looked like he was wearing a styrofoam suit. And so, uh, it just, it looked really bad. Like, if you watch it now, it is super dated. And I'm, that's like a prime example of using practical effects that don't really work. You know, so, uh, Jamie Bell is in this new Fantastic Four and they released, you know, a photo of the thing, and he's kind of like in these brooding stances, and like there's uh, one picture where he's like about to throw a punch. And the one thing I like about it is that he is all CGI, and he looks like he's made out of rocks. Like I said, the old one, like it looked like it was a styrofoam suit you find in, uh, you know, a Chuck E. Cheese, like the back of it, I don't, I don't know, like in the dumpster or something, like, he he was a rejected ch- uh, character in the Chuck E. Cheese band, so they just threw him out of the dumpster, but in this one, it looks really cool, he looks jagged, he looks rough, he looks like he can actually hurt someone if he punches someone, so it just, it looks cool, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Fantastic Four, because uh, I'm curious to see um, how Josh Trank, the director, uh, the, he previously did Chronicle, and then the cast, you know, I love Miles Teller and stuff, so I, I'm I'm really excited to kind of see where they go with it. But anyways, the Thing photo looks really cool. I can't wait to see it in action versus, you know, a styrofoam uh, birthday suit. So the next piece of news is that Jurassic Park released a minute and a half clip. And this clip has been going either one or two ways. A lot of people either like it or a lot of people hate it. Here's basically what the clip is. Um... 
Bryce Dallas Howard's character and Chris Pratt's character are basically just talking about, you know, uh, a specific dinosaur. I don't want to ruin anything for you guys. A specific dinosaur, and, you know, they're just kind of bantering back and forth very playfully, and they talk about, you know, uh, that they went on a date before and everything, and, like, so it seems like there is kind of like this uh, business and personal relationship between them, and, you know, the clip is fine. Like, I'm not in any... I'm not in any either camp i'm not saying it's, it's greater i'm not saying it's bad but as all it is is just chris pratt doing his chris pratt isms and you know being that kind of swift talking kind of dude like he was in guardians of the galaxy and he's just kind of talking to bryce Dallas howard you know cracking some one-liners and stuff while they're talking about the dinosaur and you know kind of like their brief romantic history uh, it's fine i mean if this is gonna be like the relationship between these two i'm okay with it like I bet people were, you know, they're expecting they want to see released clips of the dinosaurs. Why would Universal do that? They're holding that shit in for, like, when you see the movie. They might sprinkle in a couple with a couple more TV spots or something, but they're going to hold uh, back on these uh, dinosaurs for you guys so you can experience it in, you know, the cinema. And so, you know, the clip didn't bother me. Like I said, it it's Chris Pratt being Chris Pratt, like, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, it's just, he's being Chris Pratt, um, so, didn't have a problem with the clip, you know, but I mean, it, it, guys, these movies are not about the humans anyway, so it's like, just chill, it's okay, no one's gonna hurt you, uh, but yeah, it looks okay, but I mean, I'm looking forward to the movie, it's just the clip was just, uh, okay, but, uh, so that's the end of the news portion, like I said, guys, it was really, Really fucking slow week. I, I apologize. Um, for trailers, this was even slower. Um, the first trailer that came out, or at least the biggest one, in my opinion. Well, there are two big ones. Um, a television one and an obscure one that probably no one even, has even heard of. So let's start with the obscure one. It's called The Harvest, and it stars Michael Shannon, which I am a huge huge fan of um and this one is kind of cool like this uh child or whatever like lives down the street and she goes into this house and uh she stumbles across a young little boy in his room and he's just kind of playing video games and, you know the mom comes up and is like oh who's your friend and yeah 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 and then she finds out or the little girl finds out that this little boy has been kidnapped and basically when you hear that plot point in the twist then it's just a, uh, a series of shots where, like, people are looking really serious and, like, getting angry and, you know, it's kind of creepy and stuff. And I really like it. And the one thing I'm, I'm really curious about is, like, what's going to be the other twist? There's no way that the whole kidnapping thing was the main twist. It's called Harvest for a reason. I, I think it's either going to be really fucked up and the, this couple's going to have, like, a bunch of children in their basement or, like they it's gonna be like a cloning thing it's gonna get into some weird fucking territories and i'm super excited because i have no idea what the main twist is i i don't know but then you know saying in the trailer like oh the little boy was kidnapped or whatever and this little girl's trying to save him or whatever and the parents are stopping him you know i highly doubt the filmmakers are that fucking dumb to put that twist in the trailer if that was the main twist as soon as i got done watching i was like that was a badass trailer I want to see more. I want to see uh, what the main kind of uh, thread of this story is. And, like, if you pull it, it unravels everything. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to watch it because I don't think it's going to get a wide release. I think it's going to be, like, a video on demand thing. But, hey, I'm, I'm excited. It looks kind of cool. So if you're a Michael Shannon fan, I would highly suggest you check it out. It's called The Harvest. Um, so that's the first trailer. Uh, let's, let's dive into... Um, the only two big trailers that came out this week, uh, one is a horror film and one of them is kind of like a romantic uh, drama comedy uh, of, of sorts. So let's talk about that one. And the romantic drama comedy is uh, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And this movie, it's really interesting. It, it's kind of, uh, to quote uh, Alicia Malone on AMC Movie Talk, she's... She described it as, um, it's like a mixture of Be Kind, Rewind, it, that's the movie with Jack Black and Moe's Def, and then, uh, 
uh, which oh the Fault in Our Stars because you know that that was the young high school couple that you know was dealing with cancer and shit and so this one looks really cool it's like a combination of that and I, I totally agree after watching the trailer and stuff these two these two kids in high school like they're kind of best buds and they they kind of re- remake movies like as parodies um, and whatnot and so he stumbles across this girl who doesn't really have any friends or whatever and he finds out that she has cancer and uh, the main uh, boy and his friend make a movie for her uh, since she since they know that she doesn't have much longer to live and it looks like they're really gonna get attached to her maybe it, it, it it's like a rom- a romantic relationship or maybe it's just, maybe it's just a friendship maybe it's just a really strong friendship and he's about to lose uh, his his new friend that is diagnosed with this terrible illness and so it it looks awesome I because here's the deal it won audience award and grand jury award at the Sundance. That for the past two years have been Fruitvale Station and Whiplash, and Whiplash was my favorite film of last year. So I'm really it's high hopes. It's high hopes, man. I'm fucking going for the gold high in the sky, man. I'm, I'm assuming that this movie is going to be excellent because it's it's following the path of two great films. Uh, that won the same awards at Sundance in the previous year. So, me and Earl and the Dying Girl, it, like I said, it's got it had that really cool like uh, referential comedy. It had really hardcore drama in it, and it kind of looks like there's gonna be like a, a friendship or romantic thing happening. So, it looks very compelling. I'm looking forward to it. So, and it's, it also stars the kid. The main kid is the kid from Project X. <laughs> I like. I actually like Project X. I have like a soft spot for that, but like I think it's just funny that like he went from Project X to this, and he's more kind of like restrained a little bit. So, um, but it looks it looks great. I, I would highly suggest you check it out if you really like independent films. So, me and Earl and the Dying Girl. So, that's that trailer. The second trailer is Sinister Two. Um, the first one was directed by Scott Derrickson, who's going to go on to direct Doctor Strange now. And it, all, uh, it started Ethan Hawke. And uh, I remember when me and my brother went to this movie. And my brother's not a huge horror fan. Like, he doesn't really like horror movies that much. But, like, we liked it. I, I, I liked it. Like, I, uh, Jason Blum, I I worship the guy. I really do. He's one of the... I Regardless of what you think of his films, he is one of the best producers in this business today. And he's very diverse. And he produced Sinister and whatnot. And I like Sinister. I would say like eighty percent of it. Like the last like I would say twenty minutes. Like I didn't really care for, but I wasn't like super upset. But like the tension was so great with the build up on the first like two thirds of it. It just it kind of lost its steam a little bit towards the end. But like I still enjoyed it. But the second one, it's more of the same. Where like you know this couple moves into this house, they find you know the snuff like videotapes where like people are dying and stuff and like you can see uh oh shit what's the uh oh fuck what's the uh the a bull a ghoul a a ghoul a bull it's something like that that's the creature that like uh feeds on children or whatever in the movie and i gotta tell you like the second one like regardless if it's like the same recycled plot it looks cool like it's got really cool uh, like horror uh, tropes, like it's got fantastic, dark, rich cinematography with really harsh shadows, and it's kind of creepy with the editing on how they leave on a shot for a very long time. And uh, I love that style, and it just it looks cool. It looks generally like creepy, and so I, I'm kind of looking forward to it because that, like I said, I like the first Sinister for the most part. To where like I'm not totally turned off by a sequel, so I'll actually like. Watch this, and if you're a horror junkie, I think you'll really like it. So that's Sinister 2. Um, and then, of course, guys, I gotta talk about it. Because I, I did a whole podcast on it uh, a while back with Jackson Shrout from last year. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I ever did a television show on this podcast. Because this is a movie podcast. I, I try not to do television as much. Um, but I had to talk about it. Because... It was one of those series to where, like, when it when it was over with, because it was only eight episodes in a season, I, I thought to myself, like, 
this is definitely like the age of television. Like this, like if you were skeptical on television shows, this series confirmed it, and that would be True Detective. And so, what came out this week? That would be the the minute uh, teaser to season two, which comes out June nineteenth, I believe. And oh my god, that's like two months away. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the trailer looks really good. Holy shit, the cinematography looks fantastic. It looks like they're gonna have like that same amount of like tension between uh, detectives and like it looks like they're gonna have really cool action scenes and just brilliant dialogue. And I got I gotta tell you, it's a very weird group of actors. You got uh, Colin Farrell. Who is f- fantastic at everything he does? Then you have Rachel McAdams, which I've always found her uh, pretty good in everything that she does. You got Vince Vaughn, which listen, Vince, your comedies are slipping, but I still you are a very good actor, sir. I've seen your dramatic stuff; like you're you're good. Uh, you just need to kind of get back on people's trust a little bit after unfinished business. Cough, cough. Um, so Vince Vaughn's in it. Taylor Kitsch, the guy from. Battleship, Lone Survivor, John Carter. Uh, two of those movies were panned by critics, and he just really hasn't gotten off the ground at all. Like He's just kind of been stuck, and he hasn't really progressed in his career. And he's in this, and I think this will do it. I think this, Taylor Kitsch and Vince Vaughn, after this show, this season is over, I am 100% guaranteed positive that, like, they will be in good graces with people again because I think with the the talent of uh, great directors uh, and great writers on television series and stuff, they're going to bring out the best performance in these guys, and I'm really looking forward to it. It looks really cool. Cannot wait to see it. If you're a huge True Detective fan, I implore you to check out the teaser trailer for season two. It sets up, you know, uh, the same kind of dark and gritty tone of the first one, and so. I'm looking forward to it. Holy, holy crap. It's going to be great. So June 19th, I believe, that's when it comes out. So uh, True Detective Season 2 teaser trailer. So that's it for the trailers, guys. Uh, like I said, it's a – holy shit. It's, it was a slow freaking week. Um, so that's all the news and the trailers to talk about this week. Uh, what did you guys think about the news or the trailers? And if you have any comments or whatever, comment in the place where you my voice and let me know. All right. So let's get to the meat of this podcast. And that would be uh, let's let's start with the, the Dallas International Film Festival. Now I got my press badge uh, just this past week, and I um, I was really looking forward to the festival. You know, I had like seventeen movies picked out, and uh, next week's podcast will definitely be a lot more. But today I'm only going to cover three of them because uh, I only went on this past Friday, uh, April tenth. And I'm not seeing any movies this weekend. I'm kind of catching up on some stuff. But I saw three movies on the 10th. And I'm going to kind of go over them. Kind of give you my quick reviews on them. And maybe I can convince you to uh, uh, check them out. So let's start with the first one. The first one is a Texas uh, made film. Like it was made in Texas. It's made locally. So uh, that wasn't why I picked it. Um, I never heard of it until I saw it. I basically this. I'm not even kidding. All I did was just read the description. I was hooked. So here's the description um, for this movie. And it's, the movie's called Sacrifice. Here's the synopsis: Four teens embark on a celebratory hunting trip that goes horribly wrong. When they try to cover up the terrible accident they caused in the woods, each boy finds himself ensnared in a trap of guilt and consequence beyond uh, his wildest imagination. With touches of thriller and a horror tale, Sacrifice is also a complex character study that explores the ramifications of bad decisions made in the moment and shows us how far one can go when trying to right a wrong. That's a pretty cool description, right? And I gotta tell you, I liked it for the most part. Um, so let's let's break this down. Let me explain why. The director uh, and screenwriter Michael Cohn. Um, he was at the the screening that I went to, and he talked about it in a Q&A, and he was saying that the third act needed work. And it was it was kind of all jumbled, and they spent a long time trying to figure out how they are going to end this thing. 
that's where most of my problems lie is the third act. First first act and second, second act, it's basically the teenagers, you know, we get to see them interact and stuff and see, like, you know, they're pretty good buds or whatever. And, you know, the main character uh, sees a girl that he likes or whatever and he talks to her or whatever and they talk about, you know, their past and whatnot. And then the second act is all of them in the woods and something – I'm not going to spoil it. Like, something happens – and they keep making bad decision upon bad decision because, you know, they're kind of like – they got to be quick thinking and doing these things because of the circumstances. And so it, everything just gets worse and worse and it spirals out of control when they get home. Um, did you guys fucking hear that motorcycle? Breaking my concentration. So when the kids get home, whatever, you know, the parents get involved and whatever and it gets it gets really dark and twisted. And I gotta give it to the director uh, for props on that because at least for the for the whole film that there was this tone of like just creepiness, darkness. It was so fucking twisted, and I I loved it because the suspense was real. I felt like I was with these guys and like we were trying to uh, cover up the specific event. And like I said, it, the suspense was like super gripping. It, it grabbed me as soon as like. They went to the woods, and I was like, I was hooked in. I was like, this is the sign of a good filmmaker. Here's where the third act lies in problems. Like I said, it's really hard to skate around this because it's a very huge spoiler. There's a certain event that happens, and, you know, the movie just ends. And I kind of wish they would have resolved that, or at least built up enough uh, hints or... Uh, kind of clues at the beginning of the movie to make uh, certain characters act a certain way towards the end of the movie. And that's all I'll say. And so it kind of just came out of nowhere and it kind of bothered me a little bit. And then, of course, uh, you know, people get involved when the kids come back home and stuff and uh, the police get involved. You know, it's not a spoiler. The police do get involved. And so they kind of bring up the case or whatever and then just, you know... The detective is so adamant on getting these kids to, like, um, talk to them that it just ends. Like I said, that's not wrapped up. The whole co- controversial scene at the end is not wrapped up or even hinted at or, or clued in at the beginning of the movie so we can kind of accept it. It just kind of it kind of was a jumbled mess, but I'm still not going to knock it for the fact that it was a very good, gripping, suspenseful ride that I really enjoyed for the most part. As far as the acting goes... I didn't really care for any of the actors. Uh, the little kid. Uh, hold on. Let me look it up. The kid played by Austin Abrams. I didn't really care for him that much. He just. He seemed like he was very too for, like too forced. And it just. It didn't really flow well with like. The tone of the movie. He just seemed like he was. When he like freaked out or whatever. It just seemed like it was extremely forced. Um. And then the main character, Luke Kleintank, he actually was really good. Uh, he played Hank in the movie. And the little kid played his little brother uh, in the movie. So, But uh, Luke did a pretty good job. I, I believed him as the main character. I was I was with him the entire time. The people that play his friends, they were so-so. I'm not, there's really nothing on them. And then the dad is actually played by uh, Dermot Mulroney. And uh, he's really good. Like, he, he plays this, like, really, like, drunken father type that just like is so proud of his son because he plays football and he he speaks for his son and, and he talks to college recruiters and he just really wants to basically make sure his son is well off so he's well off basically or maybe like you know uh he used to play football in the past and something happened to where like he fell to alcohol or whatever and he couldn't go to the pros so i mean it's a very cool character and you know living in uh uh, living in Texas, I definitely understand uh, football fathers exactly like that. So acting all around didn't really convince me. I do – I mean I like the arcs of most of the characters, but these kids are fucking dumb. Like they make some bad fucking decisions and some dumb decisions too. So it, they're al- they're almost kind of unlikable in a way. Like it's – it's different, man. Like, cause you 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 want to root for them and like try to write what they've done, uh, cause they've done some bad shit. But like, 
at the same time, they're making so many stupid fucking decisions. It's kind of hard to be like, whoa, I, I kind of agree with you. So the acting all around okay, except for a couple of them. Uh, cinematography is really good. I really liked when they went to the woods. It was shot uh, just so dark and grim. And like some scenes happened at night uh, with rain and whatnot. I was like, this is actually shot pretty well. And the sound design, not so much. I don't know if it was the theater I was in, but... Like, if there was two people in a scene and it was raining and one uh, angle was on one person, the sound would sound, the audio would sound fine. And then when it cut to the other person, it sounded very muffled. So I don't know if that was the theater or the sound design, but either way, that kind of sucked. But other than that, it's actually shot very well. It's got, like, those dark shadows you see at night. And, and with the rain, it looks really cool. It just, it, it it's shot very well. Like, it's a very clean uh, movie. Like, when they're in the woods... You have the dark, rich colors of the the green and the brown and the trees, and they counteract with the uh, the blue sky and the characters in the woods. It just it looks like a a really dark murder mystery uh, film noir type movie or something, and it it totally fit. I really liked it. The cinematography in the hometown was okay, but it's it's mainly about the woods. I, I really like the way the woods were shot. So good job on that. Uh, the editing, the movie's about an hour and 45 minutes. I'm actually going to say this, and I hardly ever say this. They should have, uh, they should have, uh, made at least 15, 20 minutes more of this movie. Like, I would have been fine if they would explain a few things. Like, I'm okay with leaving a couple things wide open, uh, just kind of, in, like, make us kind of decide. But, like, there's just some things at the end of this movie where you're just like, I kind of wish that certain thing would have been resolved or something, or at least mentioned. So, you know, for its hour and 45 minute runtime, it's very, it's very engaging. And I really liked, you know, the edge of your seat type of thrill ride it was, but I kind of just wish there would have been 15 minutes more. So if it would have been like a two hour long movie, I probably would have been okay with it. But as far as it is like right now is hour 45, I just, uh, there's just some things, man, and it, and it still kind of bugs me to this day. I just, I wish there was a couple things answered, but other than that, you know, it's very, it's a very enjoyable, uh, suspenseful movie. It kind of reminds me of, like I said, like a film noir type thing, uh, with children in the woods, and it's almost like an adult version of Stand by Me. So, I, I'm gonna give it a six and a half. Like, I, I can't get it to 7, but I also don't want to give it a 6. I mean, 6.5 is fine, and it's a fresh rating. It's just there's some issues with it, like I stated, that I just didn't really care for. But overall, it was a nice, uh, suspenseful thriller that I think you can enjoy. And, like, you're going to be white-knuckling it throughout the entire thing, uh, just kind of figuring out what's going to happen next and, like, what's going to go down. Like, I was, I was. I was curious throughout the entire thing. I was like, oh, shit, like, how's this going to go down? How's this going to go down? So... I think you'll really like it if you like uh, those type of movies. So, Sacrifice, uh, first film of Dallas International Film Festival, uh, 6.5 out of 10. Second film that I saw is Five Flights Up, and this stars Morgan Freeman and Diane Keaton. Also stars Cynthia Nixon from Sex and the City. Um, this movie is basically Morgan Freeman and Diane Keaton are a couple. They're an older couple, and they live in the same kind of apartment for 40 years or whatever and uh cynthia nixon plays the niece of diane keaton's character and she is a, a realtor and she wants to sell their apartment and try to get them in a new apartment make them you know begin another adventure in life and you know the couple agrees and stuff and this movie happens over one weekend and they're just trying to sell their apartment and get a new one that's essentially it and you know there's there's elements of like you know you know, like like it's an old couple, so like they're they're kind of reminiscing on life and whatever, and they're kind of just like figuring out like why do we need to move? Like this is what we know, this is what we love, we love each other. Like this is this is our home type of feel. It's like you know, you know, getting away from your when you leave your parents' house, and it's like well, this is my home, and it's like I have to go start somewhere new. You kind of don't want to, but. Uh, at the same time, you kind of have to. But in their case, it's like they have... They really have nothing to do uh, better at a new place than they can't do at their old place. So that's why they kind of uh, fight it a little bit and they kind of give in. But, I mean, I'm not going to spoil the end. 
And in the the movie, there's uh, kind of like a, a terrorist subplot, which Morgan Freeman kind of like you know explains it as a metaphor at, near the end of the movie, but it just fell out of place. It was a a terrorist subplot. Not even joking. This is a, a feel good. I guess, romance movie about these two couples, or this couple or whatever, and they have a terrorist supply. I just, I don't know. It didn't really work for me. Um, so it's directed by Richard Longcrane, and uh, I just gave you the, the basis of the story, but as far as like the directing goes and the tone and the style and how he got his performance out of his actors, it, it's really nothing inventive. Like There's really only like three sets in this entire movie. It's like two apartments and like the streets, so it's really nothing inventive. It's just it you're basically relying on the chemistry between Freeman and Keaton, and kind of just see how they flourish and we get to see their backstory a little bit with some uh, flashbacks and stuff with to their younger selves. And you know, I got handed to the director. This couple seemed believable. I actually liked Morgan Freeman and Diane Keaton as a couple, and I really liked their personalities. Um, Morgan Freeman was kind of more subdued and kind of to himself, while Diane Keaton's character was more kind of outspoken and she kind of did her own thing. So, in a ways, Morgan Freeman was like a pessimist and she was like an optimist. So, it was a nice kind of yin yang relationship and it worked. Like, I, I felt like their chemistry and just them as a couple was real. I felt like I was watching a real couple. So, I have to give the director props on that. He totally got two great actors with great chemistry to really portray it on screen. So, I, that's, like, the only praise I can give this movie. <laughs> There's also, like, uh, they, they use a dog for, like, emotional, like, heart stabbing, too. Like, they will use this dog as, like, a way to, like, get the feels out of you. And it's like, come on, man. That's fucking manipulative. So, other than that, like, it's a very forgettable story. It's a very forgettable movie. But I think if you're a part of the older crowd, I think you'll really, really like it. It's just, for me personally, like, I see a lot of movies a year. This is going to be forgotten by next week. So, I mean, that, but that's just me personally. I don't think it's a terrible movie. It's just kind of, eh, it's forgettable. So, uh, acting, like I said, Freeman and uh, Keaton do a very good job. They have that natural chemistry. Every person that's below the age of 40 in this movie is a complete asshole. Like, they really are. Like, they're, they're rude and self-entitled and just fucking motherfuckers, man. Like... The whole time I was watching this, I was like, there's no redeemable person besides this couple. Everyone else is just a douche. And it's like, holy crap, is that what my generation's like? And it just made me want to punch something. And that's, that's how frustrated it made me. So, the acting, the acting's fine from everyone. It's just the characters are very unlikable for the most part. Like, m most of the characters in this are unlikable. And so, uh, cinematography, it's It's basic. In the city type cinema, it's clean. It's it's not anything that's like you know, whoa, look at that shot. But I mean, like it, it's clean. It serves its purpose. It's not bad. Uh, editing wise, it's an hour and a half. It hits it right on the dot. If it would have gone any longer, I probably would have been like super bored. Like I thought I was going to be bored, but I mean, it was entertaining. But like, it's not something where like I was like, oh man, I can't wait to see what happens next. I was just kind of going along for this ride, and I was like, uh. Can you let me off after an hour and a half? So, as far as the pace and rhythm goes, it I think you're like if you're an older couple, I think you'll enjoy this a lot more. But if you're my age, I don't think you'll really enjoy it, and you might get bored semi easily. So, overall, I'm gonna give this one a six out of ten. Like I just I don't want to get it to rotten because I don't think it deserves a rotten, but I don't think it deserves anything higher than like the lowest fresh score. So. 6 out of 10 for Five Flights Up. I mean, it's a nice, cute, charming little movie that I think your grandparents might enjoy. Or if you like Morgan Freeman or Diane Keaton, you might enjoy it. But it's just, it's just something that seems very forgettable to me. So but that's just my thoughts on that. So that's movie two of the festival. And the last movie that I saw on the first day was Turbo Kid. And this is a film that comes... From the Canada and New Zealand production. And I gotta tell you, Out of the three I saw on Friday. This was my favorite one. And quite frankly. It's my favorite one of the festivals so far. Unless something else can blow it out of the water. 
I saw this thing at midnight. And usually when they play midnight movies, uh, they're a little bit more mature and stuff. And, like, they're super violent or super sexual or just super dark in its subject matter. This one is insane. It's like going on this, like, cocaine, like, driven ride of violence, cheesy one-liners, ridiculousness, but a shit ton of fun. Let me read this uh, description to you. In 1997, in a ruined post-apocalyptic world, the orphan kid survives on his own through the drought-written nuclear winter uh, traversing the wasteland on his BMX, scavenging for scraps to trade for a scant supply of water. When his perpetually chipper pink-haired new best friend Apple is kidnapped by a minion of evil overlord Zeus, the kid summons the courage of his comic book hero and prepares to deliver a turbocharged justice to Zeus, his buzzsaw-handed sidekick Skeletron, and their vicious mass army. You think I'm making that up, but I'm not. Um, let me explain the movie like this. The movie is like a post-apocalyptic extremely over the top like violence and gore like in comedic style it's a live action cartoon Saturday morning cartoon show with an 80s vibe set in 1997 shot in the year 2014 or 13 yeah that's the best way to describe it it's it's an adrenaline man it's a it's a it's a trip I really liked it a lot um the director's Holy shit. Um, Anouk Wissel, Francois Simard, Johan Carl Wissel. I don't, I don't think that's right. <laughs> but they three write and direct this movie. And they really created something unique. They really created something to where like not many people are going to replicate this. Like it's just it's so unique in its own right that like. It's it feels very fresh. This is basically like a kids version of Mad Max, and by kids version, I mean there's kids instead of adults in there. It's super violent. Like this is like violence to the extreme, and it makes Kill Bill look like an episode afternoon special of Barney. Um, it's it's got like comedic gore, like if someone gets sliced or whatever, like the gu- blood is like gushing like a geyser. It is that over the top and comedic and so they have the violence they have the look of a post-apocalyptic uh era which is kind of cool because it's got really like uh kind of a lot of grays all over the place and it looks like a bleak barren wasteland that you would not see anyone in and then of course um uh like in the description says the kid or whatever he really likes a comic book hero called uh turbo Rider, and so he actually stumbles across like a spaceship uh, underground where like there is a Turbo Rider costume, and when he puts it on, he becomes Turbo Kid, and so he starts fighting, you know, this Overlord Zeus uh, because he is harvesting people, killing people because he can extract water from their bodies, and so he kind of goes on this like it's basically just a survival movie um, trying to take o- overtake uh, Zeus, and so. I'm not going to spoil any of the, the little twist in it because some of them are kind of, uh, uh, pretty cool. But as, as far as like uh, just the style and the tone from the directors, it's awesome. Because like I said, you have this uh, apocalyptic, like barren wasteland. And then you have the colorful colors of, you know, Turbo Kid's suit, which is like all red. And his friend Apple's like got bright blue, 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 blue hair. And she's very pale, and then, like, Skeletron looks cool. There's a lot of colors on him. So it's really interesting to see the contrast of, like, Desolate Wasteland with in the background. And in the foreground, you have uh, people with bright colors that just, like, scream, like, uh, hey, we're, we got 80s vibe going on. And plus, the soundtrack is, like, this really cool elect- elect- electronic, like, beat. So it sounds like a synth from like an 80s band or whatever. So, like I said, it, it's an extremely unique style. Uh, and I just had so much fun with it. So the directing on this one is super strong because they knew what they were going for. They made it self-aware. They didn't take itself too seriously. And they just wanted to make sure that you were having fun with these actors, which leads me into the acting. 
The uh, main kid, uh, Turbo Kid, is played by Monroe Chambers, and the little girl, Apple, is played by Lawrence LaBeouf. LaBeouf. Um, they do a good job in the movie, and like I said, this script is ridiculous. Like, in terms of, like, the dialogue, some of it's, like, very extreme cheese and, like, it's just ridiculous dialogue. But these actors are so straight-faced with it. It makes it so funny. And you can tell that these guys on set were having a blast while shooting this. And I think when you can see that in a film, that kind of translates to your uh, experience with the film and, like, how much fun you're going to have. So I had a load of fun. Uh, and it looks like the actors did too. So everyone kind of does what they can with this type of material. So the cinematography, like I said, is gorgeous. It is so rich in color. I just I love the way it's shot. It it's a very beautiful looking movie. It's very good visual eye candy, uh, especially when the fight scenes are going on. There's blood everywhere, and uh, there, there's just a lot of choreography and uh, special effects. It's just it looks cool. It's very very appealing to the eye. Um, the movie, editing-wise, uh, it is an hour and a half, and I think it's perfect. It was a perfect time. It's like beginning, middle, end. Uh, we are, we're introduced to Turbo Kid, and then he has to take on Zeus, and like you know, it's just it's a very straightforward story. Nothing really too uh, extravagant, but I think there's just so much action, so much violence, and so much cheese to this. I think you're just gonna forget about what time it is, and I think it's, this thing is just gonna kind of roll roll by and you're not going to realize that you watched an hour and a half movie so it's uh yeah it's just it's just that much fun guys i would highly recommend it it's my favorite film of the festival so far uh i'm gonna give it an eight out of ten i think this if you like like i said i have to just i have to keep reassuring you this this is not like if you're expecting like you know a deep philosophical thought provoking movie no, this is a very gory film. It's over the top. It is campy. It is cheesy, but it is, it is fun in its own right. And that's why I have to give it a high score. It's just it knows what it wanted to be. It didn't try to be anything else. It wasn't, and that's why it worked. I really enjoyed it. So eight out of ten for Turbo Kid. If you can check that out, please do. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. So that is part one of the Dallas International Film Festival. I'll have uh, part two uh, next week, and I'll you know mention that. Uh, towards the end of the podcast, but so that that's it for uh, the films I've seen so far at the Dallas International Film Festival. So, guys, speaking of the Dallas International Film Festival, the movies I just uh, mentioned, I saw on Friday, April tenth, and there was a thing. There was a little thing that dropped on Netflix. You know, I, just, I, I had to check it out. This little thing called Daredevil, and if you guys don't know who or what Dare, Daredevil is. It is based on a Marvel comic, and the movie, uh, the idea was attempted in a movie with Ben Affleck uh, that was panned ac- across many people, including critics, fans, whatever. Didn't really do that well at the box office, and so I remember uh, 20th Century Fox, I believe, did that one. They were trying to reboot Daredevil again, but they couldn't get it done in time, so the rights revert reverted back to marvel and so we're just like what is marvel going to do with daredevil not really entirely sure so they announced they're, they're going to do a, a netflix series and they're going to have 13 episodes and it's all going to come out at once and i mentioned this on a, a, an episode like a while back but uh they they're also going to do jessica jones luke cage and iron fist and then they're all going to come together and uh defend hell's kitchen which is the place in where Daredevil is set, and they're going to fight evil. It's going to be like, you know, the Netflix versions of uh, Avengers, and it's going to be called The Defenders. So I'm really looking forward to see how they're going to tie everything up. So you're probably thinking to yourself, how is this going to look? How is this going to feel? And, you know, Daredevil was the first kind of little tidbit into this world, so we can see how these uh, shows and everything will progress. I watched the first two, and I got to tell you, I... Am hooked. This thing is. There's no words, man. Like it's it's one of the best things Marvel has ever done. And I'm talking movies and television. It's just it's a dark and gritty series, and like 
listen, the, the term anti-hero is very, th- it's thrown very loosely nowadays. Daredevil is an anti-hero, and you can definitely see it. Like, you can tell that, like, he's trying to do good, but, like, some of the methods or some of the approaches that he takes to trying to uh, defend evil or whatever, he does some very questionable moral things. So, that's an anti-hero, and Daredevil fully encompasses that. So, how was the series? Like I said, I thought it was just really damn good, like the pilot in the second episode. I'm definitely going to watch the rest. Uh, that's the whole point of this review is like, you know, is the pilot at least good for you to continue? And I, I would say so. I think if you are a fan of uh, just comic book characters or, you know, kind of like crime television, or if you're a fan of Gotham or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you'll enjoy this one because these are this this show is far better than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Gotham in my opinion and I've only seen one episode of Arrow so I can't really comment on that uh, but this one is just it was super dark and super gritty and you know I really like I really like the choreography you know that's kind of weird to say like that's the one thing that sticks out like the two things that stick out are uh, Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock, uh, the blind uh, lawyer who is Daredevil, and then the choreography, the fight scenes. I thought they were really well done. Like in the second fucking episode, they pulled a true detective and they did a one shot, and it lasted for quite a while. And you know, you have Daredevil just fighting a bunch of guys, and you know, he's just he's a fucking beast in the series. Like he can take a punch, and he just. He is a fucking fighter, man. He is a warrior. And so it kind of just showcase, showcases us what and how uh, Matt Murdock is. Like, he's he's a beast at what he does. And he's very good at lawyering. And um, I'm really glad that they didn't go with, like, Charlie playing, like, a cockeyed blind person. Or, like, it has, like, a it looks like a fake glass eye or whatever. Like, he has his eyes. He was blind as a child. Like, he got blind as a child, so, like, he kept everything there. It's just, you know, his pupils don't dilate anymore. But, like, he doesn't, like, look off into, like, a, the opposite direction as, like, the person he's talking to. He kind of just, like, glances over to their left or right. You know, just ever so slightly. Just very subtle stuff to kind of show us that, you know, he is blind and stuff. And he can play this pretty well. Uh, instead of, like, making it so fucking dramatic. But... The acting is good. It's shot well. I love the choreography. I'm curious about the mythology of Daredevil. Because I saw the movie with Ben Affleck. Didn't really care for it. So this definitely makes up for it. So that's kind of like my short little review on it. Uh, and it looks like there's going to be kind of this really cool like through line with Kingpin and stuff. and Because that, that's the main villain. And I haven't seen him yet. Because I have not gotten to that episode. But as far as the t- first two episodes go. Because I know I can't really review the whole thing. Because I don't really know what happens but as far as like all that what i just discussed to you it's got a nice tone to it i cannot wait to see the rest so if, like i said if you're a fan of crime shows uh marvel characters marvel television in general or netflix original series check this one out you will not be disappointed uh and i would like to uh hear what you guys think about daredevil and what you think about it. or at least when you watch the pilot just the first episode what kind of impression does it leave on you does it make you want to watch more or does it make you want to stay the fuck away i don't know so that's my thoughts on the first two episodes of Daredevil and kind of like, uh, am I excited to finish the rest? And hell yeah, I am. I'm excited to see what they do with Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. Pumped. So that's it for the main uh, portion of the podcast, guys. Uh, let's jump into the weekend box office results. Uh, oh, you guys are you guys are going to be fucking shocked. So number five is Cinderella. With uh, 7.2 million, and right now domestically it's got 180, and worldwide it's got 436 on a budget of 95. So double that, you're at 190. They made some serious fucking bank on this movie. So I've not seen the movie, but Disney, good job. You know what you're doing. So number four is Get Hard with 8.6 million, and uh, this movie's kind of staying hard. You know, it's, it's still still kind of flaccid. Uh, its budget is forty million, and worldwide right now it's got eighty four, with eighty four percent 
in this country is where it's getting most of its money. Like in domestic, it's got seventy one million, and worldwide, like I say, eighty four. You double the budget, which would be eighty million just to break even. So they've only made like four million profit roughly right now. So I don't know. They're not going to really get that much from it. But I mean, at least it's not in the red, I guess. All right, and then the only one to come out this weekend, major release, is The Longest Ride, and that came in at number three with $13.5 million. Uh, worldwide total right now is 16 with no budget, but these movies are made very cheaply, so I wouldn't be surprised if they already made their money back, plus some. Um, number two is Home with $19 million. This thing is a beast. I thought this thing would die off within you know, a few weeks, but... It looks like it's holding in there because there's really no kids movies out right now. So, you know, parents are taking their kids to see home. So, I guess good job for it. I really enjoy it. I think it's one of DreamWorks' better movies in quite some time. Um, I didn't really care for any anything else after The Croods, I believe, and How to Train Your Dragon. But, like, little stuff like Turbo or Peabody and Sherman or... I never saw The Penguins of Madagascar, but I just... I don't know. It didn't really appeal to me, but... But uh, home right now domestically, it's got 129 on a budget of 135. In the worldwide total right now, it's 242, double 135. You're looking at 270 to break even. So it's almost there. It could probably do it. It could probably at least break even. But it's still a very expensive movie. I just I don't know. But uh, number one, you guys guessed it. Second week in a row, Furious Seven. How much did it make? 60 million. Last week it made 150, and so it dropped, you know, about 50%, but that's not bad considering that your opening weekend was fucking 150. So, get this, guys. Uh, Furious 7's budget was around, I think it was like 230, 240. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it's around there. Domestically, right now, it's got $252 million just in the States. Worldwide, Furious 7 in two fucking weeks. Fast and Furious 6 made, I think, $700 million worldwide in its total run. In two weeks, Furious 7 has made, get this, $800 million. This is not a typo. $800 million this movie has made in two weeks of release. This might be the first movie in this franchise, and it might be the first one in quite a long time to hit a billion dollars worldwide. The last movie to do that was Transformers 4 from last year. Guys, who would have thought that, first of all, Fast and Fur- Furious would make it to 7? And who would have thought that the seventh entry would make a billion dollars? I want you to wrap that around your head, guys. It's made $800 in two weeks. This thing is going to hit a billion. And it just... That's fucking crazy. But it totally deserves it. I really liked it a lot. Um, Rest in peace, Paul Walker. I think it was a great send-off to his character. So it deserves every fucking penny. So I just that's a lot that's a lot of cheddar guys that, that really is. So that will do it for this week's episode guys. Thank you for listening if you listen to uh, the end of this. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at real Chase Lee R E E L Chase Lee all one word. If you'd like to follow me on Spreaker here, you can click that follow button. You can get up to dates when I do these things live and when I post them and whatnot. I'm also on iHeartRadio, so you can find me on there as well. If you'd like to like my Facebook page to get up to dates on movie reviews, podcasts, uh, trailers, whatever, it's uh, facebook.com slash Lee. If you guys want to like, uh, subscribe to my YouTube page, check out that stuff. It's uh, youtube.com slash shabootnik75, capital S, lowercase h-a-b-o-o-t-n-i-k-7-5. You can find my movie reviews, podcast, web series. Uh, I do funny little trailer dubs, um, short films. I have a lot of stuff on there, guys. So you can definitely uh, whet your appetite on there and kind of just go crazy, I guess, if you're bored or if you're taking a shit and like you have nothing else better to do and you're tired of playing Angry Birds. So... <laughs> uh, you can also uh, find me uh, on We Live Film. 
uh, com and on their YouTube channel, We Live Film. I do a comedy segment there every single week. And uh, this coming week on uh, April uh, 16th, I'm doing a show live. It will be the first time, and I'm very curious to see how it's going to go. So you can find me also on DallasMovieScreenings.com. That's where I do all my uh, press screenings and stuff. And uh, Risa uh, is the owner of that website, and she's the one that gets me all these screenings. So you can thank her for allowing me to do all that. And then, uh, of course, uh, I have to mention that uh, last night uh, on April 11th, I was a part of a podcast. I know, right? People actually uh, want to hear me talk. Um, that was the first podcast where I ever was a guest on. And I want you guys to check this out. If you go to the YouTube channel, uh, uh, just type in Brian Sudfield. Uh, so Brian, like B-R-Y-A-N, and Sudfield, like S U D, uh, uh, then field. Uh, so... Was it I before E? So F I E L D. I just had a brain fart there for a second. But if you, uh, I'll put a link in the description below. But if you go to Brian Sudfield's page, he does a podcast now called The Films of, where he will take a actor, actress, director, filmmaker, what have you, and him and his co-host Amanda Dunn will talk about all of their films and their filmography, not just picking out a few that they like, but literally all of them. And so I got to participate in that last night, and we talked about Tom Hanks. And so I want you guys to check that out. Go to his channel right now, subscribe to Brian Sudfield, and go ahead and check out his first episode of The Films Of, which was on Leonardo DiCaprio. I really liked it, guys. I played it in the background, and I didn't even realize an hour and a half passed by. It just, it was that entertaining. And uh, check out... You know, the second one with Tom Hanks, I'm on there, and uh, hopefully you guys like it. We had a good time. We talked about Tom Hanks, and we talked about a lot of random stuff. So, uh, like I said, hopefully you'll have a lot of fun. So, uh, that will be that will do it for this week's episode. Uh, like I said, uh, next week I will have the part two of Dallas International Film Festival, and I will go over, get this, I think it's like 12 movies. It's going to be like 12 reviews. It's just going to be, I'm going to... I'm not going to have this like a three hour long podcast, but I'll, I'll pitch them really quick and stuff. And, you know, we'll just go from there. And, of course, news, trailers, all that jazz. You guys know the drill. So, uh, thank you guys for listening. I really do appreciate uh, every single one of you that listen. I love you all. So, thank you for watching another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast. And you know what? I'm a movie fan, and hopefully, I convinced you to be a movie fan as well. Uh, especially if you are a new per- new person listening to this and you're not really a movie fan, maybe I uh, could help uh, persuade you in that manner. So I'm Chase Lee. You guys have a good day, good night, a good day, night, what, what have you. I will see you guys next week for another episode of Rumi and Colin, a movie podcast. You guys are awesome. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs>